Please join me in welcoming Emmanuel Acho to the stage. Man, what's up, y'all? Um, first and foremost, thank you for taking time out on this Sunday, a nearly packed house. I know y'all could be doing so much. Um, before I get to my co-host for this afternoon, I just wanted to share with y'all the story of how I met my co-host, Mr. Matthew McConaughey. Any McConaughey fans in here? That's what I thought. That's what I thought. So um, many of y'all may know me either from Texas, but from uncomfortable conversations with a black man. After my, um, <laughs> so after the first episode of uncomfortable conversations with a black man, I shot it in Austin, Texas. It was an all white studio space. I um, had my wedding videographer there and my best friend, she stood in as my producer. It was not a high quality production, but somehow we made it look like a high quality production. So within five days, it, it had received 25 million views on social media, mind blowing. I never thought that it would happen. So then five days later, my phone's vibrating. I'm sitting in my apartment eating a bowl of Cheerios, healthy, eating a bowl of Cheerios and my phone vibrates. I look at it, it's a no caller ID number. I pick it up, hello, Acho. McConaughey speaking. <laughs> I want to have a conversation. I was like, wait, wait a second, M McConaughey? Like, like Matthew McConaughey? He's like, yeah, man, I want to have a conversation. I was like, okay, um, let's do it in, let's do it in four days. Now, for the record, I did not want to do a second episode. After 25 million views, you can't follow that up. So I was gonna be one and done. McConaughey calls, he says, I wanna have a conversation. I say, cool, let's do it in four days. It was gonna buy me some time. McConaughey says this, let's do it tomorrow. <laughs> Excuse me? You, you wanna do it tomorrow? I was like, okay, I can make that work. Bigger problem. I shoot uncomfortable conversations in an all white studio space. The room was painted blue. It takes 24 hours to paint and 24 hours to dry. But what am I gonna tell Matthew McConaughey? I'm not telling him nothing. <laughs> so McConaughey shows up, the room sky blue. We have a white sheet of paper. We cheat the camera so it appears that we are in an all white room. Lo and behold, I produced 10 episodes of Uncomfortable Conversations. By the grace of God, partner with Oprah, end up winning an Emmy, end up having a number one New York Times bestselling book, and the rest is history. I say all of that to say, pick up no caller ID calls. <laughs> now, uh, Matthew McConaughey, many of you all know him is an Academy Award winning actor, and that is true. You may also know him as a number one New York Times best-selling author. That is also true. You might know him as a minister of culture. That is also true. But tonight, he's just a friend of Emmanuel Lacho and a friend of yours. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the one and only Matthew McConaughey. Let's <laughs> travel, huh? I like that. How are we doing, everybody? So let's travel. I like that introduction. Wherever I go, man. That would be great. That'd be My great. Man. Thank you. It's good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah, brother. Here we are again. You know, I was sitting there thinking when you're talking about that, uh, when I called you and, 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 and then let's do it tomorrow. None of that from my end or your end seemed logical yeah at the at the time it was not but it was a, it was a hunch and it was it was a trust that we both had what you had already done what i felt and that picking up the picking up that uh that phone might not have been the logical thing to do you saying yes let's go That's might not have been logical but here we are um couple things i want to just unpack before we get into talking about his new book uh illogical so 
Last night, you did the commencement speech. Yes, sir. To the University of Texas at Austin. You had 60,000 young men and women out there. What sort of message were you hoping to instill in these people as they head out to go greet the consequences, freedoms, responsibilities of adulthood and make their mark in this world? What was your... So, true story. Um, whenever I have big communication decisions, I do call one of two people. I either call my friend Oprah or I call my dear friend Matthew McConaughey. Um, well, look, they called me from no caller ID number, so now they got to pick up my phone. Hey! Okay, being honest. That's right. So I call McConaughey two months ago when I find out I'm going to be this commencement speecher, and I say, hey, bro, uh, give me advice. What you got? He said, speak in the we. Speak in the we. He said that, you know, when you speak it, you know, you tell it, and then I'll piggyback. Speak in the we. Three tenses we have, right? I, which is personal to each one of us, a great verse we got to use because... You can tell your I story, and no one can condemn you for it because, hey, it's how you felt. It's your experience. Then you have you. Now, what you ought to do, and what you ought to do, and we all know the you speakers. We can learn some things from you, but it really starts to feel like advice that we're being told what to do. And sometimes, I know when I get spoken to in the you, I'm like, quit telling me what to do. It's one thing I know I don't want to like is being told what to do. But when you can find uh, some truths in life that are in the royal we, yeah. when we speak for humanity, I'm speaking for myself, I'm speaking for you. Hey, the, 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 the human process we're all in, it just seems to be digestible to the listener and the giver, and it lets people know that if they're going through a tough time or they need a, a, a tip moving on, that it's us saying, hey, it's part of the human experience. Me too. <laughs> I'm in it with you. So the royal we, when we can do it, seems to be a great way to communicate. So he says, speak in the we. So at Texas, we say what starts here changes the world. But the problem, they never told us how <laughs> to change the world. And so I gave the three tips that you should follow if you want to change the world. Tip number one, delight in the detour. In life, you're going to go through several different detours. You're going to have a dream, ambition, a vision for what you think your life will look like. However, you're going to have to detour at some point in time. I was drafted in the six rounds of the Cleveland Browns. Before ever playing the snap for the Cleveland Browns, I blew out my knee. I get traded to the Philadelphia Eagles. I get released. Oh, one Eagles fan. Eagle Shout fan. out. Eagle Shout fan. out to the one. There's always one. I get. A... Did you come all the way from Philadelphia? She did. Straight all from... the way from Philadelphia. <laughs> Here we go. So I get released by the Eagles, and I realize I'm going to have to detour. But the beauty of a detour is a detour prepares you for your destiny while your destiny is being prepared for you. So my first point was delight in the detour. My second point was be illogical. If you want to change the world, you're going to have to be illogical. Um, being illogical is really just veering away from conventional wisdom. So many times in life, we are afraid of other people's fears. And so if you want to change the world, you're going to have to be illogical. You're going to have to go places that have never been traveled to. You're going to have to do things that have never been done. You're going to have to think of things that have rarely ever been thought of. If yep. you want to change the world, you have to be illogical. And my final point, if you want to change the world, you have to use your thing. Oprah called me July 9th, 2020, and she simply said this, you have the thing, my friend, you have the thing. And coming from someone who had the thing and has the thing, you, my friend, you have the thing. She was essentially telling me that I have a particular gift to communicate to people. But having the thing is irrelevant unless you use mm. your thing. Mm -hmm. And so my encouragement to everyone here now and everyone last night was delight in the detour, be illogical, and use your thing. Use your thing. Yes, sir. Deep. You know... I just want to piggyback on that last thing, your thing. What is our thing? What is everyone's it? Is it always and only the thing we love? Not necessarily. Sometimes it is. Is it what we have a talent for? What's that innate ability? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because when we match, when we're talking to young people, it's like, can you match what you have an innate ability for that also in the world might be something you can supply that the world demands. Yeah. So you can make a living, right? And may it match those things. But uh, uh, it's a mix. If it can be what we love, if we can do what we love and still make a living at it, awesome. But sometimes we have to say, wait, I mean, I love doing it, but I have a talent for it. And being good at something, we do learn to love it. You know what I had to learn, brother? I had to learn this, um, that your 
career is what you're paid for and your calling is what you're made for. Mm. Sometimes in life they intertwine. They do not always, right. to your beautiful point of you might get paid doing it, you might not. My career was in the National Football League. My calling was being a man for this moment. Heard. They happened to contradict each other until they could eventually run parallel. Yeah. So I had to learn that point that you just made on the fly. Heard. Yeah. It's nice when they come together, but it ain't no guarantee. It ain't logical when they do. <laughs> hey, speaking of, of your man for the moment, um, again, before we get more into the book, uh, you also wrote bestsellers, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man and, and Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Boy. Uncomfortable Conversations was a YouTube series that won an Emmy. Before it was a book, how'd you come to that topic in the series and how has, if it has, has the conversation changed now two and a half years later? Man, so uncomfortable conversations with a black man. I'm going to tell on myself, that was not the original title. <laughs> original title was terrible. I'm glad you didn't hear the original title. <laughs> you wouldn't have sat down with me. Come on, what was it? The original title, ladies and gentlemen, it was Questions White People Have. <laughs> <laughs> this is a true story. It was questions white people have. Why, Matthew McConaughey? Uh, <laughs> because white people have questions. <laughs> yes, they do. Um, so the original title, bro, uh, <laughs> it, it was questions <laughs> white people have. And um, because they're finally here, the, the impetus for uncomfortable conversation started at my dear friend's house. I was with four people. I was with Brogan Russell, they are married. Brandon and Ashley, they are married. I believe Brogan and Russell are here. If you are here, stand somewhere. Um, beautiful. So, oh, and there's Ashley, lovely. So these are like my best friends in college. Yep. And I was at their house after the mur murder of George Floyd and I was, Makane, I was just in turmoil. I was in turmoil, bro, because I was like, something has to be done. So I go to dinner um, at my lovely friend's house and we're sitting there just having conversations. Been friends with them for a decade and change now. And we were sitting there trying to figure out how can we reconcile the racial divide in our country. But before you can rec reconcile the racial divide in the country, you have to reconcile the racial divide in your neighborhood, in your household, in your community. Mm -hmm. So I'm breaking bread with my dear white brothers and sisters and I realized, you know what? is near and dear as they are to my heart and I am to their heart, there are questions that white people have. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was gonna be the title. My friend called me, my friend called me and said, hey, Acho, it's more than just white people that have questions. You should consider changing the title. She says, you should change it to Uncomfortable Conversations. I was like, it doesn't stick, it did nothing for me, <laughs> nothing. I get back from a bike ride in Austin, Texas, McConaughey, I go into my house, I walk by my bathroom mirror and I stop. I look right. I'm like, hmm. I'm a black man. I'm a black man. Uncomfortable conversations with a black man. Um, that's how it passed up. The royal we. <laughs> yes. Um, Great title change. Yeah. <laughs> um, hey, to piggyback that, now here we are. That's how many years ago? Three? Yeah, two years, June 1st, 2020 was episode Okay. One. How or has the conversation evolved since? You know what? If we can be honest, and this is what I love about this intimate setting, um, the conversation has evolved and then it has devolved. Like we've made progress, but it's as if we take two steps forward, one step back, mm. brother. Remember, mm. it was just last week, if I'm not mistaken, the shooting in the Buffalo supermarket, Buffalo, New York, a racially targeted shooting. Um, 10 people lost their lives. Uh, a white 18-year-old goes into uh, predominantly black areas, predominantly black supermarket, and, and, and just kind of starts shooting up the place. The conversation has evolved, mm. it truly has but we see small bits and pieces of the conversation devolving. And so I think we have to all be conscious of continuing to make progress because the second that we collectively take our foots off of the gas as a society, as a people, as a nation, then we will start to revert back to the negative places in which we came. Heard, yep. Two for one sometimes at least moves us one. Yeah. You know, two steps forward, one step, one step back, which we do seem to do 
quite often. It's half the incrementation that we hope for, but we keep taking one out of those two. Let's keep, let's keep the ascension going. All right, illogical. All right. You say here, um, and I believe it's chapter one, before the cards are flipped, don't let logic limit your life. All right. What do you mean by illogical? And, 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 and yeah, let me leave it at that. Give me, define what you mean what it means to be illogical. To be illogical. To be illogical, Matthew McConaughey, is to believe it is so, even when it isn't so, so that it can be so. Green light. That's what it means to be illogical. <laughs> actually, I'm going to get to that. I actually, I actually think that's coming on a yellow light instead of slowing down, stepping on the gas and getting it. <laughs> can turn into yellow light and a green light. Uh, Go ahead. That's what it means to be illogical. I think the greatest accomplishments in our life, y'all, they come on the other side of our logic. I'll share this story quickly. I shared it last night. One of my favorite stories in all of history. May 5th, 1952, no one had ever ran a mile in under four minutes. McConaughey, scientists thought it was physically impossible. Oh, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, they said that your heart would literally explode, explode, many suggested, if you tried to run that fast. It was... Illogical. But on May 6, 1952, 1952, one man, Roger Bannister, he believed that it was so, even though it wasn't so, so that it could become so. And on May 6, 1952, for the first time in our history, someone ran the mile in under four minutes. Mm. That's not the most beautiful part of the story. The most beautiful part of the story is that within the next two years, 10 people Great. ran a mile in under four minutes. So when you are illogical, you end up going places that have never been gone. When you are illogical, you end up doing things that have never been done. And when you are illogical, you end up breaking barriers that have never been broken. So that's the beauty of being yep. illogical. So are you saying that logic is oftentimes a limitation, that logic equals doubt, that doubt is a logical summation, that to say, oh, that's the status quo, that's how it is, no one will ever run for Four, four minute mile, that's yep. how it is, to believe in the status quo, to, to, to say that's what it is, that, that sort of logic is a limitation. And yes, because it's easy. My coach um, back at Texas, my defensive coordinator, you'll remember him, Will Muschamp. Yep. Fiery dude. Will Muschamp, and I'll, I'll, I'll remove the explicitives <laughs> because this is Sunday in a family audience. But Will Muschamp, he said, Acho, don't be like water. Water takes the easiest route. Hey. What he meant is, if you were to pour water on the ground, it will just take the path of least resistance. Mm. And what we do so often in life is take the path of least resistance. See, we, we, we live in the small town that our parents lived in and our grandparents lived in, and we never leave because that's what's logical. Yep. Though we have a passion to start our new job or to become that entrepreneur, we just stay at our nine to five, even though we don't love it, mm -hmm. because that's logical. We're in the relationship for six years, and though we know we probably shouldn't get married, we end up marrying the person because that is logical. logical. So I believe that we should try to veer away from logic because logic limits. Heard. You know, I... Uh, uh, a word that I use um, is my, and I've actually been reading about it lately. Someone else <laughs> is repeating that. I like to talk about this word, but my least favorite word, unbelievable. Mm -hmm. This is in part and parcel in the same song that you're singing here. Um, unbelievable is a limitation of a belief, whether it's something awesome in our life or something tragic. I believe that we all need to have the courage to admit these things and believe in them, whether it's the greatest beauty or the greatest tragedy. It happened. And, and, and it is, it's part and parcel in what you're talking about. There's something, to, um, there's a logic to the illogic, yeah. is, is what I'm saying. Um, so, speaking of logic and illogic, you've gone from the NFL, well, first off, University of Texas, thank you, <laughs> to the NFL, to being an Emmy winning host, to a web series, to a best selling published author, to a bachelor host, to a sports analyst. What's the logic in your illogical career path? That's a good question. Did you come up with these yourself? These questions? That was good. I that called good. Oprah on my call. No call out of <laughs> Everybody's a comedian today, I see. 
Um, man, the logic to my illogical path. Yeah. I think the only logic there is that I am going to continue to lean into the uncomfortable. Okay. In my NFL career, I had a decision to make. After my fourth year in the National Football League, I had been hurt three times. I had torn my groin, I had broke my thumb, and I had torn my quad. Now, I was 25 years old, so why not keep playing? I hadn't even hit my physical prime. But what I said was, there has to be more to my life than this. Right. So I leaned into the illogical path, and I said, I'm going to move on. The oldest text message in my phone is from August of 2016. McConaughey, I got a text. It was like 10 o'clock at night. It was from the Buffalo Bills. Hey, Acho, please send us your date of birth and your social security. We want to book you a flight to Buffalo. Had a decision to make. I was out of the National Football League, but do I want to go back in? I didn't hey. respond. I got a text 30 minutes later. Acho, so-and-so from the Buffalo Bills, I need your name, your date of birth, your social. I want to book you a flight to Buffalo for a tryout. I made the illogical decision that day to just say no, to be done. Yep. Leaning continually into the uncomfortable is the only con consistency. That's the logical, you'll see right. The logical. Heard, heard. Um, I want to talk about something that I've written about that's also um, leans into what you're talking about here. I talk about the yellow light. Someone brought up green light a minute ago. So green lights go, yes, keep going, no resistance. They're like water, right? Green lights. They do not impede our way. Red lights on the opposite end. We don't like those. It's full stop, crisis, death, whatever. The yellow light, though, is where really seems to be the art of living is. That's where the choice mm -hmm. lies, the place where we have to pause, think for a second, where the illogical choice offers itself. And you can either what at a yellow light? You can either slow down to go to a red light and stop, or you can put that pedal to the metal and blow through it. Now, both of these can be just as illogical at yeah. times. There's times where I've slowed down to the red light where that was the illogical choice. The logical choice was to blow through it. Mm -hmm. And there's times where I've blown through the yellow light where that was the illogical choice. But both of these can be illogical. You and I have both deliberately created pathways to the future that we're living now and to, to where we're heading. What are some more of these illogical choices you made to get to where you want to go? Like that one there, Buffalo Bills call. No, thank you. Not going. Illogical. What are some other choices you've made? I think the most illogical yet career-defining decision I made was um, starting Uncomfortable Conversations and how I did it. True story, I was, um, I was thinking about doing Uncomfortable Conversations, but everybody knew me at the time as a sports analyst. They want to hear my takes about sports. They don't want to hear my takes about life. Right. But every now and then, you have a conviction so heavy on your heart that you can't shake it. Yep. So I said, I'm going to do Uncomfortable Conversations, but here's what it's going to look like. I don't know what it's going to look like. Right. So I, um, I rent a studio space in Austin. Uh, my dear friend Carrie, I believe I'm looking at her. Stan Carrie, shout out to Carrie. Um, she, um, she owned the studio space. Now, I'm going to take a quick aside and brag on her, then get back to, the, back to mm -hmm. it. After I rent the studio space, it's an all-white place in Austin. I just called my, 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 um, I, I called my friend Mo and said, yo, find me a studio. She said, okay, it's done. I called my friend Britt. I said, Britt, you got a videographer? She said, yeah, he shoots weddings. I said, a wedding videographer will work. Yeah. Um, so I use a wedding videographer. The beautiful part of why I asked Carrie to stand, when she overheard me rehearsing uncomfortable conversations, she said, hey, you can use my studio for free whenever you need to for this. Like, I stand behind this message. Mm -hmm. So quick aside, for those that want to know what allyship looks like, that's what allyship looks like. Um, because truth be told, I just took my money out of my pocket to start Uncomfortable Conversations. Right. It cost me time. It cost me energy. It cost me effort. And more than anything, it cost me vulnerability. Yep. And so it was illogical to think that a wedding videographer, an Olympic medalist, and myself could sit in a room and have a conversation that would garner the attention of Matthew McConaughey. Um, that was illogical. Yeah, thank you for taking that one. Um, <laughs> you know, I want to I want to go back, and I thought this hit me last night. Um, I I consider myself a very deliberate person. Like I like to write the headline. You know set the goal, then write my story to the headline. And when I went to go write my book, I thought that 95% of my successes, things that I got achieved and 
got access to in my life that made me happy and gave me satisfaction, I thought that 95% were going to be, they were goal sets. Mm -hmm. And then I go back through my writings of 45 years and I looked at a little over 50%, I was jumping off and figuring out how to fly on the way down. On the way down. Uh, they were not the headline. They were not engineered. They were not clear. Um, and it, it's, 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 you know, yeah, I chased some wet dreams to Africa and Peru. No logic in that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's literally what I did, you know, and I did not know where I was going. I just set a compass down. But I was, it reminds me of your book because I was reminded last night that, that, that as much as I've, no, I've thought through my life that I've chased absolute logic set a goal that no, actually a lot of more, I, just, I figured it out and took the hunch, ran that red, ran that yellow light or, or slowed down when it was easy to go through it. Um, you also say in your book, don't fail, you fall. Mm -hmm. Talk about the difference of falling and failing to you. I had failed so many times in my life. Um, I was in eighth grade at a private school in Dallas, Texas. And I had to get a 72 on the final exam to not flunk out of that school. Somehow I got a 73. And I'm still here. Um, I was in the NFL. I comparatively failed in the NFL. Uh, my older brother played nine years in the National Football League. Beast. I mean, just killed it, killed it, killed it. I'm just sitting there trying to stay afloat, just like trying to stay in the National Football League as long as possible. Um, I failed, so to speak, in the NFL as it pertains to having a Hall of Fame caliber career. But then I finally realized I didn't fail. I fell. And as long as I get up, I win. Mm -hmm. So this is something that, I mean, everybody can use. Because so much of it is, that was your choice to perceive that way. Logic says, oh, didn't make it to the Hall of Fame, didn't do as well as your brother, you failed. World says, but you chose to go, no, I'm going I'm, I'm to I'm look at this a different way. So it was just a mental yes. change. And that's one of the things that I think we all can get from this is so much of, you know, so much of failing or, or falling is that we give, we give when we do fall too much credit. Mm -hmm. We, we, we give it, it's like those dramas in our life that, that don't need to be dramas. But they become dramas because we give them so much credit. It's, I know when I, when, I, when I talk about it in my book, there's certain, we get in a red light, some of us like to stay there. Yeah. Oh, man, it turned green. I don't want to go yet. Let's pile it on. Uh-uh. You know what I mean? So it's, it's a perception choice. You know what it is? And this is what I've realized, and many of you may have heard it before. The problem with so many of us collectively, what we continually do is make this pivotal mistake. We put periods where commas belong. Yep. Yep. That's our problem. Like we put a period somewhere, but that's not the end of the sentence, nor is that the end of our story. So we put a period somewhere thinking this is where it stops when a comma belongs there. Yep. Like if I would have put a period at the end of my NFL career, then nothing greater happens. Right. But the NFL career was simply a comma, and I got a run-on sentence coming. Amen. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm with you. We do it, you know... That's why I put no G on the, on the, on the end of J.K. living, because life's a verb. <laughs> you know? It's a process. Here's my you know? thing, though, Matthew. I feel like you, you do a lot of things uh, colloquially. I mean, you say heard. 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 Um, just, Seen. Just that. You say all right three times as three if time. one isn't enough. No. <laughs> so. It fits the meter. It fits the musical meter. <laughs> my man. <laughs> Um, I want to get into this, unpack this, because you talk about it, it, it illogic chooses resistance. You said, uh, um, you know, the difference between falling and failing is that you chose to get up and say, no, it's, life goes on. It's that's a comma. The story goes on, whether it's the end of the sentence or the end of the chapter or the end of, not the end of the book. I guess that, the, yeah, we got multiple chapters and paragraphs, but not the end of the book. Is this book, an argument for faith. Mm, that's good. It is. Um, truth be told, when you talk about being illogical, I always I say it's believing it is so, even when it isn't so, so that it can be so. But truth be told, in my heart of hearts, I believe it's believing it is so, even when it isn't so, so that it can be so, because God said so. Okay. Right? Um, truth be told, I think that 
We all have a divine supernatural calling on our life, a divine supernatural conviction in our heart, a, a divine supernatural ability that we all have and that we've all been blessed with. So when you want to talk about being illogical, there are so many modern day stories, yeah. but there are also so many, whether it's biblical stories or historical stories. Um, colloquially, we always in sports use the story of David and Goliath. We always use that story. Right. But you want to talk about illogical. That's illogical. Yeah. That this, this boy, this Hebrew boy, as the text has it, could slay a giant. That is illogical. Um, but the beauty of of being illogical, and as I talk about that story in my book, is it's when you have your thing, McConaughey, it's what you develop in private leads to your praise in public. And I so desperately hope everybody hears that. Because mm. in this day and age, everybody wants to get famous quick, get rich quick, become a star quickly. But it's your development in private that leads to your praise mm. in public both in the story of David versus Goliath and my story and your story. I started here in Austin. Fox 7 Austin was where I started after I left the National Football League. Local news, just mastering, trying to master my craft on local news and in what you could consider private as it pertains to the mm. national world. But it was my development in private that led to uncomfortable conversations that would ultimately be seen very publicly. So there's a huge faith component and illogical has faith littered all throughout because yep. my life has faith scattered all throughout. Heard. Yep. It's it's a uh, um, trust is hard. Yeah. Trust is hard. You know, we talked about, and it starts from the uncomfortable conversation to the choosing illogically. It starts with uh, when you walk past that mirror and looked over and said, "Oh, I'm black man." Mm -hmm. You know, that was the first that that trust. How do, how do we, how do we, let's talk about, how do you trust in the illogical choice? Because we don't want to be foolish, right? We're mm -hmm. not saying, I don't think, I don't, you're not saying, hey, go be foolish. You're yeah. not saying be anti either. Correct. You're not saying go against the grain because it's against the grain. I mean, we've got that, everyone's got that in them, but we're saying don't go with the, 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 the status quo. How do you trust that when it is the path? The, it, when it is the Robert Frost path, it is the it is the path least known. It is not the autobahn. It is not the masses. And only you know, only you know. Two a.m. when you're by yourself, what's in there tickling inside the soul? How do you wake up in the masses and go, "Oh, I'm back. The lights are on again. Huh, I'm a sheep. I got to go with the flow." How do you know? Go into that and trust. No, I'm going to walk my own path among the masses. I'm gonna I'm gonna choose door number two. I mean, everyone else is going to do it more. Trust. There's a nuance there um, that I describe, and I believe it's chapter 14 of the book. What I say after talking about all the great accomplishments of heroes and all your future great accomplishments, I, I kind of couch the book by saying, if all you've heard is that you can do anything, you've heard too much. Mm. Being illogical does not mean you can do anything. I could not run a mile in under four minutes, regardless of how hard I trained. Because I am not predispositioned mm -hmm. to do so. Um, but being illogical is what do you have that innate ability yep. to do? Yep. And trusting in your own innate ability. You have an incredible innate ability on stage as an actor. You have an innate, incredible innate ability. Um, I have ability to use my words on the fly. I do not prepare for any conversation at all. I just go up there and freestyle and I trust it. I don't encourage other right. people to do that. <laughs> but, um, but in the same manner, I don't have the ability to go do so many things. So what you do is you trust your God-given gifts. Right. And you trust that you have a God-given gift because everyone does. So all the trusting illogical is, is you have a choice to make. Makane, every day when we wake up, we have a choice to make. Are we going to choose faith or are we going to choose fear? But regardless, we have to make a choice. Yep. You might as well choose faith. I'm with you on that. Might as well. <laughs> even if it doesn't work out mm -hmm. this time, still, let's choose Correct. it again and, and again and again. Even if it doesn't work out, you can work it out. Right. That, I think, is the right. beauty of everything. Yep. You know, we think about, and you were talking to young men and women last night, that innate ability. There's a lot of people out there that are going, wow, 
what's my innate ability? What are you, what are you, what are you, what are you talking about? I, if I only knew my innate ability. It's a good question. It's something to, that's tough to find sometimes. Yeah. T- something that's tough to trust in. Um, but boy, yeah, if we can find it and then bet on it, educate ourselves on it, yeah. understand how to use it wisely, maybe even scale it, that does seem to be the honey hole. No doubt. About how to go forward if we can. Um, all right, I want to talk to you about something. I think it was chapter three. Don't forget your earmuffs. Don't forget your earmuffs, y'all. <laughs> Kick out your own internal negative thoughts when they arise. These ones of doubt we were talking about. Kick out your own internal negative thoughts. You know, it, 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 he's talking about, I was talking with the big tech council the other day, and the metaphor, which, which I thought was nice on this, is that we have to, before tech, we have to have a firewall for these viruses because these internal thoughts are viruses. How do we keep those out? Because it, we know it. I had a guy, I was going through it yesterday, and it's a, ste- it's a steam train. One leads to another, leads to another, leads to another, and all of a sudden I'm like immobilized going, what the hell, how did I do that? I just did that to myself mm-hmm. in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you got to talk about that. Talk, talk about, I got a feeling you got to get into some football here about how you have to say when you talk about kicking it out as they start. Man, I think the hardest thing, one of the hardest things we have to battle in life is ourself. Um, one of my prayers every day is, uh, God, keep me from me. Because mm-hmm. sometimes I'm my own biggest enemy. Um, the, the self-doubt, it is our biggest opponent. Yeah. Because while we all have this belief that we can do something, there's a small voice in your head that says, but what if you fail? But what if you fail? Yep. That small whisper that becomes a roar. Uh, And I think what we have to do is feed the the, the belief, feed uh, the the, the conviction, feed what we know to be true. And oftentimes, so many people, even those you love the most, are going to doubt you. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll, I'll tell this story. When I wanted to do uncomfortable conversations with a black man, a dear colleague of mine said, hey, Acho, I don't like this idea. It was a dear black friend of mine. She said this. She said, white people did not educate us on how to assimilate into their culture. Why should we educate white people on how to assimilate into ours? And I sat with that message for a second, but I said, I just have to go the way God leads because I had a conviction Mm -hmm. in my heart. Mm -hmm. So why do I say that? I say that because that was my calling. But the beauty of your calling is it's not a conference call. No, it's not. No, <laughs> it's not. It's not Nobody con- CC'd on the message. At all. No. And so sometimes if you know it to be true, you just got to block out your noise yep. and don't forget your earmuffs. Yep. Heard. Heard. And oh, don't it feel good when you pull it off on the other side? <laughs> You know, um, I want to say that on the on the on the on the failure and the embarrassment. You know, so many times it's those that fear of those people that are go, they're gonna go. You know, thumbs down, na na na, boo boo, you failed. Those people are up in the stands for a reason. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Everybody on the field, I know when I fall, the great players on the field are right there going, "Whoo, happened to me too." Mm-hmm. Here, get up. Let's stay in the game, mm-hmm. you know? Um, I like this one. <laughs> the first drop of rain. It's a chapter in your book. Don't let everyone on your boat, how you choose and who you choose to let on your boat in success. Oh, good. Only 24 hours in the day. <laughs> Boat's only so big. I like this dude, y'all. <laughs> I like this, my, it's my brother from another. <laughs> my brother from another. Um, you can't let everybody on your boat, uh, uh, man. Uh, uh. Um, when, when you finally do succeed and you overcome the doubt, all of a sudden you're gonna get a lot more popular. Yep. People are gonna find your phone number. I don't know if it's the yellow pages, the white pages, the black pages, the blue pages. Somebody's page is gonna have your phone now. Yes. And um, you're going to get a lot more popular, but the, the, the thing you have to remember is, you can't let everybody on your boat. 
because if you do, it might sink. Yeah. <laughs> so after the success, when it comes, because it will come. Now, keep in mind, I like to believe in significance over success. Significance to me is making an impact on other people's lives. When we talk about success, so many people hear about it monetarily. That's cool, but significance to me means more. When it does in fact come, you can't let everybody on your boat. Mm -mm. The quick aside of the first drop of rain, what's interesting about the first drop of rain is that means the flood is coming. Let me praise my brother real quick because I don't have, often have time to do so. Um, there's a story, Hollywood movie, biblical story, um, about, the, about Noah. And Noah was building an ark, though the earth had never seen rain. And scientists and theologians submit the earth had never seen rain. So how in the world are you going to build an ark? But after building the ark, I can only imagine McConaughey when Noah looks up into the sky and he gets hit in the middle of his brow with the first drop of rain. What's that tell him? That the flood is coming. The flood for me was that call from Matthew McConaughey. Because when I started Uncomfortable Conversations, I had no idea what was going to happen. But when McConaughey called, that's when I was like, uh-oh, the flood is coming. Mm. Because what happened next? That's when Oprah calls, and then Chip and Joanna Gaines calls, and then the commissioner of the NFL calls, and Little Wayne calls. The flood was coming. <laughs> it started, mm. though, with the first drop of rain. All right on. Thank you for sharing that. I'm there. Um, one of the most provocative chapters in your book is called The Goals Are Dumb. <laughs> let's, let's, let's deconstruct this a minute. Um, again, I, I think it's fair. I know I'm a deliberate person. I know you, you have deliberation and intention with your choices, yeah, even with the, the logic to the illogic. Uh, we hustle. We're ambitious. We strive. What do you mean when you say goals are dumb? Let's go here, shall we? Yeah. Um, I believe that the easiest way to fail in life is to set a goal. It was 2011. I was here on this campus. My brother had just went to the National Football League. He was one year older than me. I, too, wanted to go to the National Football League. I wanted to leave after my junior year. We were on the heels of a national championship in 2009. I came, I saw, I accomplished, it was all good, I wanted to go. The NFL told me, hey, Emmanuel, you won't be drafted in the first three rounds. What you mean I'm not going to be drafted in the first three rounds? You know who I am? Anyway, <laughs> I, I took that sheet of paper that said you won't be drafted in the first three rounds, and true story, I hung it above my bed. Because what do they say about goals? Commit them to memory. Mm -hmm. So I looked at it every morning I woke up and every night before I went to sleep. I'm going to be drafted in the first three rounds. Well, at the NFL Combine, after my senior year, and I tried to do everything right, I'm running the 40-yard dash, McConaughey. I'm running, I'm running, I'm running, and I hear boom, boom, boom. I thought my heels were clicking. My quad was being torn off the bone. Mm. I'm running through it, I'm running through it. I grasp at my quad, and I fall to the ground. I don't get drafted in the first three rounds, even though I set a goal. Mm. I was devastated. I realized at that point in time within my life, a goal at best it puts a ceiling on your life. Sure, you achieved something, but what if you could have achieved more? A goal at worst, it ruins your self-esteem and it ruins your self-efficacy. A goal by definition is the end towards which energy is aimed. Why would I start something with the end in mind? So instead of setting goals, I believe in having an objective with no limitations. An objective is energy aimed at a direction. Mm -hmm. So now I just live life moving in a direction. See, a goal is finite, but I want to live a life of infinite possibilities. Mm -hmm. So now I commit to believing goals are dumb. Yep. But quickly, um, and I know we are going to open it up for, for audience questions that have been pre-pulled. Quickly, I remember, um, I think the best look you've ever had. You're in an all-white tux, my friend. It's your best. You have good looks. I'm not going to lie. You do. <laughs> I like the hat. <laughs> I like the glasses, but you're in an all-white tux. Truly, truly, I try to study those that come before me, study those that I think are brilliant. And when you won your Academy Award, mm. you said something that ran parallel to my belief that goals are dumb. You said something that runs parallel to my desire to have an objective with no limitations, to essentially have no endpoint. Matthew McConaughey said one of the most brilliant things I'd ever heard in regards to his hero. 
Um, if you do recall, can you please share what you said? I said, uh, need something to chase in life, and what I'm chasing is my hero, and that's me in 10 years. And I said, I'm never going to catch him. <laughs> Yesterday, he was 10 years ahead of me. Today, he's still 10 years. He's, he's not nine years, 363 days ahead of me now. He's still 10 years ahead of me. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an objective to chase. It's a potential. It's a belief, a faith, a, uh, in an ability, in a man I want to be, a person I want to be, um, that I know I will never catch. It's sort of... My pastor talks about the difference between joy and happiness. A lot of times happiness is a finite thing. It has a period at the end of it. If I can achieve this, then I will be happy. And you achieve that and you get there and you think you're at the top and you, and you look around and you go, oh my gosh, I just uncovered a whole thousand more mountains that were taller than this one. Joy is the process of the doing what we are innately have the ability to do. Um, it's, it's something that keeps life being a verb for me. Um, it's, 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 and, and it also, look, we got one, one, one way ticket and a lot. Now we can argue too, faith and religion that that's, that this is not even a one way ticket, but the only finite one way ticket we have here is death. Everything else is at least round trip. <laughs> you take detours, you circle back, you pull your quad don't go on the first three and make up your mind to do something else, even though that was devastating at the time. Um, your book isn't finished. You didn't shut it. You started a new chapter, uh, chasing yet. I think we're all chasing yet, and that's what I mean by me being my hero in 10 years, and I'll never, I'll never catch him, and oh, I'm so happy I'll never catch him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Um, well, we got some questions that we've pre-pulled from the audience. Um, Kathleen will ask them and we will answer. Question number one. What's the biggest mistake you'd, you've made that you'd never undo? What's the biggest mistake you've made that you would never undo? You want it or you want me to take it? You go ahead. Let me think about this. Y'all see how he does me? <laughs> well, it's, 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 a, it's a tricky question. It is. Because when you don't want to undo it, you start to go, well, was it really a mistake? Ah, <laughs> that's where I go with it. <laughs> the biggest mistake I've made that I would never undo. I feel like I've made a lot of mistakes. Um, the biggest mistake I've made that I would never undo. Interestingly enough, I'll go back to uncomfortable conversations. Truth be told, if someone were to tell me how big a deal it would have become, I would not have hired a wedding videographer. <laughs> right, right. It makes no sense. Like hire a high quality video team. But about Five episodes into uncomfortable conversations with a black man, I started to ask myself, how is this product so digestible? Like, how is my videographer telling the story so eloquently? And one of my friends said, well, they're a wedding videographer, so they're used to telling long stories very succinctly. Mm -hmm. I said, I didn't even mean to do that. Right. So truth be told, that would probably be the biggest mistake okay. that I would by no means understand. Heard. My, mine, mine's, I'm going to give you a hardship that, I, that was a living hell that I would not give back for nothing. It was a year in, a year in Australia after I graduated from high school. And I went over there. Um, the story's in the book. I don't know if you've read it. But it was a pretty insane year for me uh, where I really, really split my differential and lost my grease but made it out. But I had given a handshake deal was saying I would stay the whole year. And the details of the story, by all logic, would mean... Pull the parachute, but kind of, hey, come on back home. You, we're, we're gonna, we're, you got every reason. No one's blaming you for none of this, but I stuck with it. And um, I lost myself, and I was forced to find myself because I lost myself. And that was the hardest year of my life, but the one I would not undo because I would not be sitting here right now with the life that, that I'm living if I didn't have that year. No way. I love it. I love it. This next question is for Emmanuel. Do more white folks or people of color stop you to ask about these books? Do more white folks, <laughs> I don't know that, white <laughs> folks. Um, <laughs> wait, what is it, wait, wait. <laughs> Questions, 
white people have. <laughs> uh, Uncomfortable conversation. <laughs> um, do more white people or black people stop me to ask about uncomfortable conversation? It's twofold. Um, I will say that it's both a stoppage of gratitude, gratitude for two very different reasons. Uh, my white brothers and sisters that stop me for uncomfortable conversations, it's a gratitude of illumination. Hey, thank you for opening my eyes to something that I hadn't previously seen or previously understood. My black brothers and sisters that stop me for uncomfortable conversations, it's thank you for saying what I didn't know how to say. Mm. So it's a gratitude, but for two polar opposite reasons. My favorite text from a black friend of mine after I, I started Uncomfortable, he just simply said, bro, this is what I've been feeling, but I had no idea how to say it. My favorite text from a dear white woman who I still have not had the privilege of meeting after I started Uncomfortable Conversations, a sweet white woman named Lynn, she emailed me um, and uh, she said, uh, uh, dear son, um, thank you for uncomfortable conversations with a black man. My name is Lynn, and I live in Alabama. I didn't grow up, in, she said, I grew up in the 1940s and 50s, and I didn't go to school with any Negroes. However, I still understand I have room to improve. Please don't give up on me. I love you, my son and my brother. Um, yeah. And... Um, I close my eyes when I tell that story because I have to reread the email yeah, yeah. as I'm telling it. And that was probably the most heartfelt message I'd ever received. So it's, it's being stopped, but it's gratitude, but for two very different reasons. Amen. Next question. If we could copy your homework and apply one tactic or tip to our life, what would it be? My brother? Copy your yeah, homework. Y'all see, you're not going to get me twice. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> What's one tip you can copy my homework? Well, if it's multiple choice, I was the guy who always put E all of the above on it. <laughs> I always put, I would put E, I circled E on, on every, all 100 questions on quite a few tests. <laughs> I thought they were all possible. Dude, you're uh, not. <laughs> so, so I, I didn't do good in those classes. I did better in the essay classes where I could write it out. Um, I'm going to go... Well, there's a there's a, a theme here, and 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 I'm going to go back to the analogy. It's, think of these things in our life: victories and successes, satisfactions and failures, embarrassments and 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 losses. Again, think of them as commas. Come on, keep rolling, keep rolling. Get up another day and know that that person next to you, that person you're running into, as much as we like to say, "Aha, you fell, you lost." Again, the people that, that are doing that, we're in, they're, in the, they're in the stands for a reason. Everybody you need to play with is over there going like, oh, yeah, I'm not undefeated either. <laughs> yeah, because I chose resistance, the right kind of resistance. And it's not really a risk you're taking unless you can lose the fight. So choose the risk that you can lose the, lose the, lose the fight. And, um, yeah, and, 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 <laughs> and the failing is falling. It's not really failing. That's good, man. Um, if you could copy my homework, I would suggest you don't. Um, <laughs> I was not the smartest Acho in the family. Um, but if you could copy one tip of life advice. <sighs> That's a good one. I think it would truly be follow your heart until it leads you to that destiny. I think that's what it would be. And I think it would be lean into the chaos. Lean into the chaos. Life is chaotic. The life that we live in chaotic. Our society is chaotic. At times, uh, we go through death. We go through hardship. But sometimes, you just have to stand in it. And you just have to stand in it and lean into that chaos. Because in that chaos is when the beauty within you mm. is unearthed. Within that chaos is when the resilience within you is unearthed. Within that chaos is when the strength and fortitude within you is unearthed. So you don't truly know who you are at your core until you face chaos. Right. And once you endure the chaos of life, that is when you will continue to refine yourself until you are that most beautiful version of yourself. Yep. And so if you would copy something from me, I would simply say, lean into the chaos 
because that chaos will turn into a beautiful picture of yourself. Okay, last question, and I think we all look forward to this answer. What do you have in mind for the next Acho McConaughey collaboration? Hey, hey. Hey, hey. Man. What do we have in mind? We're, you're, you on the road for a while? I'm in LA, bro. When are you going to visit? I know. I'm, I'm not in LA anymore. I'm out here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't, you know, I personally, I don't, I don't know, but um, we've got a kindred spirit and we, we, we both have a, have a similar aperture for our, our approach and how we look at the present and the future. Um, so I, I'm quite confident our paths are going to cross with a mutual uh, endeavor somewhere again, whether it be like this or the next project I have or I call and invite you in or you call me from a call, no caller ID, yeah. you know, yeah. or uh, the next thing you do. But um, we'll continue. And uh, we have there's, there's parallel paths I, I believe we're running and where those intersect are sure enjoyable for me. Yeah. Yeah. I would say... Um, you know, there is no clear answer, but I know this much to be true. You do life with people you love. You do life with people you respect. You do life with people you believe in. Um, I've never called this man and he not picked up. And to my knowledge, he's never called me and I not picked up. And the beauty of, to my knowledge. It's um, true. It's hard. <laughs> the beauty of our friendship, the beauty of our relationship is that we so, so genuinely believe in one another that McConaughey would call me um, back in 2020 just to talk. And I'd be like, bro, aren't you like on set? Shooting like a movie or something? <laughs> but he would call me just to, just to rap and just be like, hey, I want to pick your brain on some things. I called him out the blue and I was like, hey, I want to host an event. I want to talk about your book. I want to talk about my book. I want to talk about life. He said, when and where? I said, let's do it May 22nd. And he was like, count me in. Like, that was it. There wasn't any big, illustrious process. Hey, can I pay you to be? No, it was just like, yeah. I called my man. He's, he's chosen to believe in me, believe in us. And um, when the moment's right, you make it happen. And good people collectively can do great things. I'll say it like this, and then McConaughey, where you want to take this conversation next. If you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. And my brother and I, we choose to go far over going fast. Heard. So that's a great outro right there. But let's 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 rip back and forth and let's summate some things here uh, that are about illogical, about your book, about your approach that we've spoken about. But if we're going to get bullet points here, we're talking about um, logic as a limitation. Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, um, don't let logic limit your life. Doubt is logical. Uh, status quos are are, are logical. Uh, um, talk about courage. We're talking about uh, uh, what else are we talking about? Faith, having faith in it. Trust, belief. Um, illogic chooses resistance. Life is a verb. Significance over success. Objective aims instead of goals. Um, uncertainty falls instead of fails. All uncomfortable conversations, even and especially with who's in the mirror. Detour, commas, next, what I learned, where am I going, is it clear? No, it's not, but I know the direction. Ladies and gentlemen, thank y'all so much. <laughs> McConaughey. Cool, man. <laughs>